Usually my friend uh, Jim Geddes uh, has been really focused on the insecurity of things and I'd hope for him to come here and do this talk instead of me because uh, I do find this stuff depressing. I like very much to have an internet that we can use and to be able to trust that my light bulbs are not spending spam or spying on me. Recently I tried to install a Wemo light bulb in my house and I got the app. And I looked at the app and the app asked me one of my contact information, my phone number, my schedule, access to my calendar, my email and my friends. And I decided that my uh, light bulbs wanted to know too much about me. So, I ended up writing this talk to try to talk about what I think is a meta problem more than the actual physical problem that we have. But just to, oh my gosh, is that, 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 that font's okay? Good, good, okay. So, uh, unlike modern OS's, the typical IoT device is a teeny little box. It's got 64K of RAM, it's like a Commodore 64. It's got a tiny amount of flash, it has no MMU. You're driving around the super, information superhighway with a, uh, without a seat belt, <laughs> turn signals, or any other form of protection. And uh, it's not really what we consider an OS. There's no tasks. You load up a piece of program code as an overlay, you run something, you change a little global state, and you throw away the overlay and keep going. What could go wrong? Well, I had a chance to poke into some uh, IoT code from the Riot OS, which is a GPL system. This is the free call. You're supposed to be recoiling in horror now because all it does is throws away the, data, uh, the, the memory. So any device that uses free in this particular OS will eventually run in the system out of memory. So be afraid, be very afraid of your light bulbs. But I've been thinking about how we model stuff. I had my t-shirt here which has the ISO 9 layer model. Uh, which includes the political and the financial layer and as I worked on this I realized that I'd come up with 11 layers for how our systems really work. And a really increasingly important one is the historical layer. We have to deal with 50 years of accumulated cruft. Then there are the seven layers we know very well and then eight layers, three layers on top for individuals and organizations and government. This is what Bruce Schneer, this is how he describes how our systems actually work. But our problems are not that we have divvied them up into these kind of layers. Our problems are about how we interact with each other and across these layers. We have people here in this room and elsewhere that have very different motivations. Some have money, some don't. Here we try to communicate, but we also would like to communicate securely. We would like to be free in our communications and we'd like to have low latency, high bandwidth and so on. And every person in this room is focused on a different portion of the stack. If we look at hardware in particular, I didn't bring it, I'll have to uh, show you guys later. Um, we have a lot of hardware going back 50 years. We have a lot of code that no one understands anymore. We have a lot of bad ideas, some of which are deployed, some are not. And we have a few good ones like the internet itself. And we could make better hardware. But hardware design languages themselves are stuck in the 80s in terms of interoperability and reuse. You can't design a circuit and hope that somebody else can plug in that circuit into your circuit so you could build something better. You can, chip making are done by the big monopolists, some, some foundry somewhere and you get the chip and then maybe you can use boot 10 million lines of Linux code to run a JavaScript piece of code to twiddle a register to blink a light. There's a problem in there. <laughs> and makers everywhere, you're making stuff out of chips, plucking them together but you're not actually making chips. So I've been thinking over the past several years is that mm, FPGAs are cheap and getting cheaper. You can get 98 nanometer technology to make your own chips. And uh, CPUs are now in the design scope of small teams. There's been several open source and non-open source CPU designs built by under five people in the last several years. So we can make better CPUs, things like OpenRISC and the RISC-V. Who's heard of the RISC-V? 
Nobody. Go Googling for that one. It's an entirely open source CPU design designed at Berkeley using the Chisel design language, which is based on Scala and easy to understand and make modular. And there's plenty of other code for circuits. The uh, project I meant to hand around in this room, Toki, could you go open my suitcase and bring back the uh, box? Um, there are switch designs and CPU designs and radio designs that would all benefit from more access to design skills for these devices. And I go around to everyone I've gone to for over 10 years now. I used to ask a different question. I used to ask, what would you do with a billion transistors? And these days I'm asking, what would you do with 10 billion transistors or 100? Anyone? No? Well, well, good. Tell me later. <laughs> the, uh, I would hope to see the kind of work that Electra is doing on making uh, radio scale down. Why not just build a better radio in the first place? Ah, so I wanted to illustrate my point. This is a, uh, uh, a dual core A9 uh, with a memory on this side for the conventional processor running um, Linux and a memory on this side for a very fat and capable FPGA that talks to a four port phi here. This is not a switch chip, this is a phi. The actual switching is done in the FPGA. So if you've ever had an urge to add an algorithm say like cake or FQCODL to hardware, this is a place where you could innovate and build a better switch. It already supports open flow and stuff like that. And this particular FPGA is also widely used in SDR applications. So if the code for a better switch chip was open sourced and available, and if the code for a better SDR stuff was available and interoperable, and we knew how to make our own CPUs, we might be able to make further progress forward. It's a pretty cool box. I got six of them. If anybody's into this kind of design, I am uh, hoping to find people that want to play with that. If you want to pass that puppy around, it'd be great. And uh, in looking for new ideas, there was a lot of research into more secure and more capable architectures back in the 80s and 90s, but almost universally, faster and cheaper won out over more secure. Going back to Multics, who's heard of Multics? We've tried to build better, safer computers but almost always faster and cheaper, one out. It's taken ages for things like the no execute bit or stack guard protections to make it out into the software developed today. And even those are lame compared to the kinds of security improvements we could make if we embedded good ideas in the hardware itself. So I have uh, done a lot of work in looking into different kinds of CPU architectures. There's things like transport triggered. There are Things, ideas that predated risk. There are things like DSPs, and there is, in this particular case, um, a, a CPU design that I really like. It's in the progress of being developed today. It's called the Mill Computer. Uh, it has four features that are really awesome. One of my dozens of features that are awesome. One, it context switches in under 10 cycles. A lot of the reasons why we're seeing firmware embedded um, for a high-speed Wi-Fi is that you need a local dedicated CPU to talk to the uh, Wi-Fi card to go at high speeds because we can't context switch fast enough. So that's cool. Um, all the memory from here to here inside the CPU is purely virtual. Most CPUs have physical memory in there and they have to have a very hot and high-speed translation look-aside buffer to do that. In the case of this uh, guy, it actually has a protection level buffer and translation look-aside in two separate parts of the chip. You can do protection on memory down to the byte, not the page. There's no need for artificial stuff for stack guarding, etc., built into the architecture. There's a bunch of other crazy things in there, among other stuff. It can theoretically execute 32 instructions per cycle. Uh, it can uh, also, stack space itself is entirely protected and off, and basically impossible to, to do stack smashing attacks. It's an extremely promising, 
create crazy sets of ideas. And if you want to think about the out of the box and how to design something newer and more secure, start there and work sideways. However, oh, one more weird thing about it, there's no registers as we know them. And it's taking a while to produce a compiler. Still, the communication problems that we have are at every layer at the stack. The EE types, the research and material scientists, the theorists are all kind of in a group focused on fixing the physical and data link layer. And EEs tend to think about circuits, stuff happening simultaneously all over the place. It's not a program that runs sequentially. And an error of one part in a million means that your system crashes in a fraction of a second. So they're very intolerant of errors. The IEEE, ACM, many of the people in this room are focused on working on the network and transport layers. And their foci are just a bit different. We are trying to enhance communication, security, work on things that are low latency and high bandwidth. And we don't go to the same parties as the EE guys. Uh, the problem that I've spent the last five years working on, buffer bloat, it was basically in part caused by miscommunication between these two groups of people. Go ahead. IET, uh, sorry, that, yes, that was supposed to be IETF. I'll fix it later. <laughs> okay. Now, there is no session layer. People keep trying to wedge one in there, and if we actually had one, we would have got it wrong. Uh, but I love the work that I've been seeing in things like MOSH and QUIC to try to create protocols that are capable of migrating between IPv4 and IPv6 transparently. And uh, I hope that we do end up with session and presentation layers that make sense. And these people aren't going to the same parties as the IETFers and the IEEE. <laughs> Usually. And then there's applications. We all use those. And those in turn shape stuff up and down the stack no matter what your motivations are. And then we have these layers of the stack here where people are focused on their individual rights, organizations need to form and manage their rights, government needs some, some kind of governance needs to exist, and all these groups of people are all pushing up and down the stack and communicating with each other, um, but not necessarily communicating fully. Uh, and I tend to look at it the problem is that not that we have this layering here, but that we need more people focusing, remembering that, hey, today I should go out with talk to an EE or have dinner with a politician or code up something with um, or design a circuit that works with a new piece of software, faster crypto. So I have a few action items. If you can hug an electrical engineer today, have dinner with a politician. Attend a meeting outside your comfort zone. That was one of the hardest things that I've been doing. I started going to IETF meetings. I'm an open source guy. Wow. Different environment. Um, and I've also been to IEEE meetings and I've been to Battle Mesh meetings and Linux meetings in the hope that I get people to understand each other. Go ahead. I'll argue that just two things that are one thing outside of your regular comfort zone would be great. And I remember when I first lured you to the IETF, just how dubious of the process you were. What do you feel about it now? I have changed my mind quite a bit. And the fact is that like in the very large community, there is no community. There are a bunch there is a bunch of people who happen to try to work on the same thing and there are extremely I'll also argue that having a beer with someone you argue with regularly over email really helps. Not always. <laughs> Those people are paid to be in bad faith. That doesn't work. I agree that there, that's difficulty, but it helps to try. So 
there are many mixed motivations for how people work on their code and the internet today in this room. There are people that are politically motive, motivated, freedom motivated, interested in mesh networking, wanting to make better use of the Wi-Fi spectrum. And I have to admit that my, my motivations are a little different. Um, this here is the launch of the ARCHID's 3 CubeSat. I don't know what the other satellites launched with. It sat in the launch bay at the ISS for a month before they tossed it out and it worked first time. How many of you here work on Linux? Your code's up there. Not only is it up there, it's almost every new spacecraft being designed. It's a critical part of SpaceX's operations and the ISS. So when you write your code, you might want to think that it might end up running places you never imagined. And if I get this right, I was going to show a picture of all the asteroids in the solar system, wonderfully animated in 3D from the databases we've collected. Mesh routing protocols are possibly going to be critical to connecting all the devices that we have in the solar system. And it's my hope, if we can bring it up, that the insights that you've gained from working together and from communicating across your skill sets and across the layers will someday make it possible to explore and communicate that. But in conclusion, we have to come up with ways to get along. I realize that there are Batman people and Babel people sharing the same room here. It's doable. It's really possible. <laughs> it's possible for us all to somehow take stewardship of Spaceship Earth and bring it into a safe landing. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I like to, I like to uh, under promise and over deliver. <laughs> and this originally was up until last night at two o'clock in the morning an incredibly depressing talk about all the things wrong with IoT, and I had to do this. <laughs> oh, anyone else? All right, we resume our original program. Uh, only 14 minutes late. Not too bad. Thanks.